The country's spy agency watchdog says the SIS behaved in a questionable way when it decided not to tell the police it knew a serious crime was being committed. The report by the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security comes after RNZ revealed in September that a former SIS agent made a complaint to the security watchdog after being haunted by the memory of what he found during a covert operation in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Investigative journalist Guy on Espiner explains what happened. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, the SIS are targeting a man, they're targeting a house in Auckland. They break into the house. One of the SIS officers or agents captures photographic evidence that there is serious sexual abuse happening uh, by this man perpetrated against his daughter. Now we're talking about serious sexual offending. He goes to his superiors and says, I think we should call the police on this. The police need to intervene. He's rebuffed. He's not allowed to do so. It haunts him for a long, long time. And when the service podcast came out this year, the podcast that uh, John Daniel and I did into the SIS operations in the Cold War, it brought this up for him again. He went to the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security, that's the watchdog of the spy agencies, and he made the complaint, and that's what has been released today. The report from the watchdog, the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security, into this complaint that the SIS knew had evidence but did not lodge a formal complaint, allowing serious abuse to continue against this uh, woman for at least two more years. So, what has that report found? Well, the first thing it found was that there was serious criminal offending and evidence found by the SIS. I should point out it's a heavily laundered uh, report. They have to, by law, put this report out. They, this is a sanitised version, so we don't have names and details. So what was, we know, was serious sexual offending, they are calling serious criminal offending. But, look, that's the first important point, that they did find evidence of that and that they did not inform the police of what they had learned. Now, they go on to say that, look, to be fair to the SIS, they didn't realise the gravity of the offences because in subsequent years this man was convicted for more than 10 years jail for these, these crimes. Now, they're saying that when they got this evidence, they did not know the, the, the full gravity of that offending. And so that's a sort of mitigating circumstance, if you like. They also say, oh, well, look, there weren't processes in place for us to inform the police. We were operating under old legislation. I, I, I should point out they were not prohibited from doing so. They could have gone to the police and they did not. For did me, they th even have a discussion? Well, so they, they didn't go to the police, but did they actually sit down and say, this is the evidence and make an informed decision about what their move would be? Well, you've absolutely hit on it. And it, it, to break your question into two parts, there apparently was a discussion. The SIS claimed that there was a discussion with the police Police, there's no evidence that they can produce to say that. But to address your other point of the question, they did not give the police their evidence. So there may have been some discussion, oh, there may be some abusive relationship going on here, um, but they certainly did not pass on what they knew. That is very, very clear from, from the Inspector General's report. Do we know if their motivation was that they didn't want to compromise the operation that they were clearly carrying out? Effectively, that's what a reasonable person could, could, could assume. That, that's the only assumption that we've got. We're not told why they were targeting this person and this person is not named in this report. One of the most obvious things... Well, the obvious question is, isn't it, should the SIS have told the police. Now, this is the most interesting quote in this uh, fairly, you know, uh, official sort of bureaucraties report. Quote, what is reasonable for an intelligence agency in such circumstances is not necessarily what is reasonable for an ordinary person. In other words, what would you and I do? <laughs> I know what I'd do. <laughs> I'd ring the police straight away. They are saying that the SIS was in a different circumstance and that there were conceivable reasons why they may not have gone. You've hit on one of them. Possibly it was so they didn't compromise an intelligence operation. Maybe that intelligence operation involved foreign partners. It's quite possible it did. MI6, CIA, possibly the Five Eyes partners. We don't know that element of it, but for whatever reason, they didn't want to compromise it and they didn't go to police. This is an agency that operates by stealth, though. This is their core business. So it raises another question. If they didn't want to overtly 
notify the police, surely they have the means, expertise and skills to ensure that the information gets to the police by some other avenue. Yes, indeed. I mean, in fact, as you say, that's their bread and butter, isn't it? Um, to, to be able to do these things from, from behind the scenes. So what, whatever action they could have taken, they, they did not do so. And um, it's interesting to see the conclusion of the report, which, you know, it... it, it it doesn't really want to come down against the SIS. It says the behaviour was, quote, questionable in not informing the police, but Brendan Horsley concludes that I do not find myself in a position to reach a firm conclusion that the service acted improperly by not informing the police of what it learned. So questionable but not improper. Now make of that what you will. OK, so one of the single most important things in this is is the woman. She was a girl then. She would be, what, a young woman now. Do we know if any apologies been made to her, if there's any recourse for her? She was a young woman at the time. She would be, um, she, she would be um, middle-aged or older now. She uh, was in her 20s um, when this particular abuse right. was happening, although the abuse started a lot earlier than that. I asked the SIS uh, recently, as part of the investigations into this, whether they had any comment uh, on that and on whether they had anything to say to this woman, um, and they did not respond to my question. I do not know whether they have you know, used back channels to, to communicate with this person, but they certainly haven't released any comment to, to me uh, about that, although I have raised it with them. The other issue is, if they didn't have systems in place then, do they have systems in place now? Because I know you spoke to the minister um, at the time, and he seemed to have a different standard for behaviour that he expected from this agency. So do we know that if this happens again, they will inform the police? Well, yeah, and that's what the SIS have said to me, that, um, OK, they didn't have the processes in place, then they do now. And as a result of this, this particular case, uh, just in October of this year, they've beefed up their protocols, if you like, and that they can share information with police and customs if they come across serious criminal offending. The intelligence officer has to report it to their superior, but then they don't have to report it to police. There's nothing in the law. It's still the discretion of the intelligence agency, right up to the top, about whether they do actually have to pass it on to police. So they, they could still come across crime and decide for their own reasons not to pass it on. And that was investigative journalist Guy on Espen and the